All right, hey, and welcome to the Globe Trotters podcast, where we feature the travel stories of real everyday people in the hopes that we may inspire others to look beyond their borders, literally and figuratively. Uh, my name is Jonathan Otero, and I'm pleased to welcome you on the next leg of our journey, along with my two co-hosts. Hi, I'm Saskia Hatvani. And I'm Maximil Gonzalez, welcoming you to the next episode of our series. But before we go there, if you missed our last episode featuring Nick Collins and his group of friends backpacking in Kodiak Island, aka Bear Country, go back and hear about his encounters with 1,500-pound Kodiak bears. Yep, that's right. And uh, today I'm chatting with Luna Benichoux. Uh, we actually went to high school together in France, so we're pretty close. While she was in business school in Paris, Luna went on a study abroad program and fell in love with India. She later returned to apprentice at a yoga studio in the Himalayan foothills. But a few weeks in, things started to go south. Uh, this is an important story and one that's sadly not uncommon. So a fair warning, this episode contains language and stories of sexual assault that may not be appropriate for minors and could be disturbing or triggering to certain audiences. So listeners, be advised. Okay, so welcome. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not like we just spent an hour trying to figure out this audio situation. <laughs> okay, so, well, let's talk a bit about yourself and about how we met and stuff. So could you just introduce yourself? Okay, so my name is Luna. I'm 25 years old. Uh, I'm from France. And uh, you and I, Saskia, we met in high school. <laughs> We were both in this uh, international high school that was amazing because uh, so many students were uh, from abroad. And for a French student like me, it was really an amazing experience in the sense that really opened me up to the rest of the world. That, that actually was the first step in, in my um, desire to, to travel uh, abroad. Uh, people like you actually really made me want to go outside my country and discover other cultures and yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird for us to be speaking English to each other. <laughs> <laughs> we usually speak French, so it's a little awkward. Maybe it doesn't sound like we're really close friends <laughs> in English, but we are really close friends. <laughs> so um, We weren't really friends in high school, but we became friends right after high school when we were like working uh, summer jobs and so we started hanging out. I think I was working at the like the jazz festival and you were working right, right. next door at, at like a hotel. And right. um, and then we would see each other on our breaks and then we, we started hanging out more. And I think that's actually how we became friends is from yes. seeing each other on yeah. our breaks. And we had friends in common, like very good yes. friends in common. Of course, but of course. But yeah, we were from different friend circles. Yeah, you were from the English American speaking people group. And <laughs> yeah, <I> was, <laughs> more it's with the true. Frenchies and <laughs> you were with the French clique, and I was with the English yeah. clique. So, where do you live now, and what do you do? So, uh, well, right now I'm in south of France, but a few months ago I was still in India because it's been four years I spent bit more than half of my year in India. So during the winter in France, where the touristy season is really dead and down, it's the high peak season over there. And when like it starts to be the rainy season in India, like it's the summertime in France. So I can come and work in mm -hmm. South of France. Yeah, in the tourist industry. So like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so how, how did you get into traveling to India as much as you did? Like, where were you in your life before you started going back and forth between India and France? Well, I did this uh, business school in Paris. That was for five years. And there were two years abroad. And so I did one year in Kazakhstan. During this one year, I had one month of holiday. And I was very close to India. And like, I got Kazakhstan, but I didn't want to go to Kazakhstan. I didn't know <laughs> where the country was. So like, I didn't, that wasn't my first choice. So when I had the opportunity with this one month holiday, I, I was like, okay, I want to go to India. It's very close. It's cheap. Uh, so I went with two of my other friends. I, I fell in love with the country within like the first few days. 
so, so many people helped us because when you arrive in India and you don't know much about the country and you don't know how it works and you arrive in a city, it's very chaotic mm -hmm. and it's, it's really fun at the same time. But you, you need help from, mm -hmm. from the locals. Otherwise, you cannot make it because the systems are very different. The way to take the bus, to book the bus ticket or, the, or anything like is becomes... Um, a struggle. So I, I fell in love with the country and I felt like I didn't see enough. I wanted to see more and I wanted to travel on my own this time. Because mm -hmm. So I kind of found out like uh, ways of returning to India with my school. I uh, I had to do internships, you know, every every year. So I did my two last intern internships in India, one in uh, close to Bangalore in a very nice uh, place in Karnataka and uh, the second one was more um, interesting in the sense that it was in a yoga studio mm -hmm. I, I, like it was just an excuse like I, I was not going to do marketing internship over there but I kind of like <laughs> made it happen for my school but because you you were in business school in Paris yes. right you were doing a business degree yes yeah. I mean I remember talking to you at that time I felt like you didn't really like the degree that you were in is that right? No, like the only reason why I'm so happy I did this school is because it allowed me to travel. And no, I was not interested mm. in my studies. You know, at this time when you're around like 22, 23, you're looking for yourself more than uh, what you want to do. I mean, mm -hmm. that's part of it. But like, uh, you still don't know who you are. Personally, I, I didn't know. And, uh, and I suddenly felt so much happiness in me by just evolving and living in this environment so I wanted to dig deeper and understand mm -hmm. what makes me so happy and like I just got addicted to the fact of like of, of being happy and uh, I understood it was the mm -hmm. environment it was the people it was the philosophy and I got really mm -hmm. interested in that so I really started uh, a spiritual journey over there and it's very easy in India to 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 to, to find spirituality and the mm -hmm. problem is that, unfortunately, it kind of became a business with time. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, are, there are a lot of frauds. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that for a fact, because when I went for my second internship um, in Rishikesh, Rishikesh is the um, city of yoga mm -hmm. where it was born. So there, there are hundreds, probably even more ashrams over there. All yogis will go there, you know, to visit or spend time or do their uh, teacher teacher training programs. And so you ended up in Rishikesh at a yoga studio, yeah, right? Like, yoga center. Yeah, so th there are so many yoga centers over there, and I tried many. Mm -hmm. And then a good friend of mine encouraged me. They encouraged me to go see this teacher because he's amazing. So I really went mm -hmm. in this new yoga studio with trust already. You know, I was like, okay, it's it's mm -hmm. recommended from someone I know, so the person must be good. So I already had positive expectations, uh, which is not good. It was like a couple. Mm -hmm. It was an, an Indian man with a Russian woman. And uh, when I arrived, I was the only student mm -hmm. because it was a very low peak season. And so they gave me so much attention, the two teachers, the husband and the wife. And the problem mm -hmm. is spiritual tourism is very tricky because... They teach you these beautiful techniques that they didn't create. You know, they learned. So you learn these techniques, you try them for yourself. And it's amazing to discover how, what it is to be blissful just by sitting or just by staying in a certain mm -hmm. pose or by breathing in a certain way. And so the problem is that you associate these amazing feelings that you have or these realizations with the people that taught you the techniques. Right, And that became tricky because, uh, well, they were not genuine mm -hmm. and they, and they become some mm. kind of like authority figures without you even realizing it. Yeah. Okay. So let's back up a little bit. So I remember. Yeah. Because, you... I, yeah, I, because there's, there's so much, I don't know how to like organize my, you know. Yeah. I totally understand. I mean, you told yeah. me this story a couple years ago and I remember just my jaw dropping. Like I remember thinking, what <laughs> How, what you know i mean it just it sounded really crazy and, and and we had stayed in touch throughout a good part of this and i had talked to you when you were first there i think and when you were you know really starting to get into yoga and meditation and 
like you said, a spiritual journey. So practices, yes. Yeah. So yeah, so let's just uh, back up a little bit. And so like I, how- took, I, I took classes with them. I really yeah. liked them. They really liked me. And then I came back to mm-hmm. France for I think half mm-hmm. a year or something like that. And we would be in touch all the time. Every day they would send me like quotes or images or news and I didn't have parents I connected with and they were like parental figures in a way you know so I start my new life over there I'm planning to stay a year maybe two maybe three because you know you you don't learn yoga you know in a day (laughs) or in a month so explain a little bit the situation like these yoga centers you stay in them right you have accommodation and food and stuff or how does it work well, the, the one I went mm-hmm. to was very small center, uh, very, very small. They were just the two teachers. Some yoga studios are huge and they have hundreds of stu- students in just a class. It's very more like a, uh, like a factory, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to go into these, though maybe they might be more safe mm-hmm. in a way. But not always, actually, because even in these places, sometimes strange things mm-hmm. happen. Usually, yes, there is accommodation for the period of time that you will stay and study. But usually the the study time is like one month or two months. Some places are community based and and that's Mm -hmm. a different thing. It's like um, it's ashrams. But then you really decide to like to live there and drop everything. A lot of people would think about it like it's a sect. Uh, Sect in, in English is cult. Cult. Okay. Some people would say it's a cult. Yeah. But uh, it really depends. Some mm-hmm. some some of these communities are very genuine. They are not around anyone. Of course, there is always like a, a spiritual figure, but you know sometimes it's just a dead person, and uh, people just uh, mm-hmm. live around their, 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 their its teachings and things like that. And in other places, yes, there, there right. are cults as well. Mm-hmm. But where I went was just a regular small school. You know, nothing nothing like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it doesn't mean anything, actually. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't mean you're safe. It doesn't mean you're safe because, um, like, these touristic spiritual places in India attract a lot of uh, young women. Like, I will, sp- I will speak for the young women because I am one and that was my experience. Mm-hmm. And because I heard a lot of stories around that, there are many mm-hmm. male, male teachers and... People, yeah. young women, they, they come to these places and they're looking to break their conditionings, you know? They want a, a more meaningful life, which is a beautiful thing. But then the problem is that they use this against mm-hmm. you. They'll, they'll start, you know, mm-hmm. manipulating you. And whenever you will question something, they will say, oh, this is one of your conditionings, you know? So they will... You know, they, they, they will use that against you to, they will almost tell you to stop thinking in the end, you know, mm. because you're judging because that's your conditioning. Mm. So how did, how did they approach you and what were they telling you? Like, could you give examples? When I arrived at the, at the very small school, I had the agreement that I can stay for free at their place and that I can mm. work for them and then they'll train me for free. And there was actually, I didn't know, when I arrived, Mm. a girl already was living with them as well. She was my age. She was American, Brazilian. And uh, I remember I arrived and they were were like, okay, you will sleep with her in the same bedroom. Then I felt like, well, I'm not paying for accommodation. Mm. I'm not paying for food and I'm not paying for the training. It's a pretty good deal for me. So, okay, I can live with a girl in the same bedroom, you know, like there's so much space around. Okay. But the girl was weird. Um, she felt it, it seemed like she was, I don't know. There was something wrong about her, but I couldn't, you know, put my finger on it. I tried to make friends with her, but she was distant. First, I thought maybe she's jealous, but she was not really. We started working, the three of us, me, the main teacher, who was the Indian man, and her on projects on how to develop the center and bring more uh, customers. I, I started noticing few few things like she would wake up very very early in the morning like at, at five in the morning at the same time as him so I would sleep and I would not notice mm-hmm. but one day I woke up and I saw her doing breathing exercises but she was sitting on him and that was weird and that is not like that is not normal at all wow. like the couple they had a kid 
the Russian woman and an Indian man, they had a kid and they were, mm -hmm. they were living just up, upstairs. And that was weird. And when I, I started asking her questions, she often replied to me, you know, like, you know, like, I'm not judging. And she would seem like uh, naively happy. But mm -hmm. it was, I don't know, the, the, the vibe was very, uh, something was wrong. And uh, yeah. And uh, all the students were very like, they were behaving around the teacher like he was a god. Right. And even I was like super looking uh, up on him, you know? Looking up, up to, to him. him. I, was looking, yeah, yeah. I was looking up to him, yes, because, because of the knowledge. It was like I became obsessed with the knowledge. I really wanted to learn. You become obsessed mm -hmm. with the teachings. You, and because he says so many truths that, that resonate with you, then when he says something stupid or inappropriate, you don't question it mm. because you think he is the truth. He tells the truth. He is uh, somewhat at some level of consciousness that you didn't reach yet. Right. And so you, you put so much trust in that and you stop, you stop questioning things. Mm. It started with the, the girl being kind of strange and you had like a, a weird feeling. And then one morning you see her like sitting on him and doing heavy breathing wait but sitting in what way yeah. like in in a like in the in the lotus position on him in the lotus position as well oh. like she's on top of him right yeah that's that's strange that's no like the teacher is not supposed to touch you really the teacher is not no he can correct you during poses right. he can grab your your foot he can grab your 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 arms it's fine mm -hmm. he's not supposed to touch you like that wow no way and so what else started making you suspicious? Like what else happened? I would notice little things like, so we started talking spirituality outside, outside class and then talking about like astrology and compatibility. Oh, uh, astrologically, uh, you and I are very compatible, you know, and like start talking mm. about these things in a very casual way, like we were friends because we were friends because we we're like a family as well. And because also he was like a father figure. So he really mixed up yeah. all the signals and the informations. And also he would always give us a lot of different tasks and we could never complete them. So you don't have the time to stop and understand what's the situation, you know? Right. When it was time for us to eat, because all of the students, we would all eat together. Everybody would cook, everybody would, everybody would participate. He wouldn't do anything. But then he would be the only one to whom we would bring a plate with all the things on it. When we would all, once everything was ready, we, everybody would make his own plate. Yeah. He would wait that someone would do it and someone would do it immediately, For you know, him. without him asking. So everyone else would like buffet style, fill their plate up and then someone would bring him a plate. Yeah. Yes. That's very strange. Goes co that goes completely against what he's teaching, you know? Which is what, for example? You're, you're, you're not supposed to have such a big ego that you think that someone will serve your plate for you, you know? You, you, put, you right. participate. Like, you don't put your students below you. You're supposed to have this, mm -hmm. this vision of, like, everybody's on the same level, you know? You're supposed to have so much humility that you can learn as much from your students that they can learn from you. And that was not mm -hmm. that dynamic. But I, I didn't have much knowledge about all of these things. And I was young. and uh, right. But a lot of the much older people were tricked in as well. So the age doesn't even mean anything. I think it's more of the, the context. Totally. You kind of want to fit in. You, yeah. Nobody talks about anything like totally. that. Nobody criticizes because criticizing is a bad thing in spirituality right. you're not supposed to totally it doesn't mean you should stop thinking you know you should yeah. still think yeah it's like you're leaving this open canvas for someone to write on for you and if it's the wrong person you can be in serious trouble it explains why this is quite a common occurrence in a spiritual teaching environments like recently there was a documentary about bikram you yeah, know, Bikram, the guy, yeah, I saw it. <laughs> I watched it. Uh, who was huge. I mean, Bikram yeah. Yoga opened everywhere in the United States and it yeah. started with this one guy. And Osho. Yeah, and Osho. And Osho um, f 
well, there was the documentary Wild Wild Country. Wild Wild Country, yeah. Yeah, and that is also another um, situation where otherwise beautiful teachings um, were misused. Yeah, misused by people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are some other red flags that made you think, what's going on here? Oh, well, it's pretty simple. Um, One day we had this meeting, the three of us. His name was uh, Krishna. That wasn't his real name, but yeah, he used that name. And um, Krishna and the and the other girl, Danielle, and me. And we finished the meeting. He talked to us about his vision for the future of his uh, of his center, and he was like, it was very like you know prestigious and ambitious and blah blah. He said, "Let's celebrate." He made us smoke together because I mean. Smoking weed is is a is a thing that people do in the world, and that <laughs> people do as well. Yeah. That was actually also a red flag for me because a truly uh, spiritual teacher in India, you know, of yoga, will not he will not smoke with his students. Mm-hmm. But it's you know, because he became cl- yeah, it's unprofessional. But that's the thing; there was no real defined limit. Was mm. I his student? Was I his employee? Was I like a family member? Was I a friend? Was I like his daughter? Right. The, right. Nothing was defined because we don't want to define things here. Mm. There were no boundaries, really. So we started smoking and then he gave us a hug. And and then like uh, we were like the three of us hugging and then the hug became very long. And then... And then we kissed. I remember, I remember, I, I remember feeling in my whole body that that was wrong. Oh my God, yeah. I remember that I didn't want to do it, but I remember as well that I was like petrified. I was petrified. I was so shocked because it was like a father to me, you know? Mm-hmm. I didn't see that coming. She didn't mm-hmm. see that coming, but she liked it because she fell in love with him. Mm. I was traumatized, but I didn't do anything. And mm. that's the that's the that's the most interesting I mean, that that's the most crazy thing. Like I always said, I don't know how these girls can say yes and then you know and then you know they regret and you know, like but it's not like that. You've been so manipulated for mm. a certain period of time and with the context you, you are so lost that you are not able to process the information when it happens. They catch you in a moment. Uh, he was an experienced man who did this, I think, a lot of times. And so in the moment, mm. I don't know, I kissed him. And, and and I didn't know why. And and that was weird. He kissed her and then he kissed me. And then I was like, what the? But I didn't know. And for, and for <sighs> a few days, I didn't yeah. know. I couldn't understand. Because the crazy thing was, I still wanted to stay. I still wanted to stay because I wanted to learn yeah. what I came for. Mm-hmm. And uh, I need to talk to someone. I I I, I had kind of escaped the center um, mm-hmm. for a few days, and no no one knew where I was. And I met a friend, an Indian friend, and uh, I told him everything. And Indians, they know. The thing is, we are starving for spiritual teachings. You mean like in the Western world? In the Western world, yeah. yes. Uh, but they in India grow up with this. Mm-hmm. So, so they're not starving and they're not stupid mm-hmm. and they will not fall for the first, you know, a spiritual, spiritual teacher mm-hmm. and they will feel the right people, you know? So he understood very quickly. And what's he, his and name? His name is Punit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was like, okay, Luna, you need to go now. You need to leave this place. And I was like, oh my God, I need to leave this place. I need to leave this place because, because I kept on defending. I was, I, I kept on justifying. There were a few stories like that that were uh, red flags before this happened. I was with him once, I remember, uh, and we see my my teacher uh, in the in a small shop, and he's like, "Oh, Luna, how mm-hmm. are you?" And I'm like, "Oh, meet my friend Punit." And then immediately, I was like, "Oh, what what kind of shampoo do you think I should I should use for my type of hair? What kind of Ayurvedic shampoo?" And the teacher is like, "Use this one," you know. Like, he mm-hmm. knows what shampoo <laughs> goes for my hair. But I'm like, okay, so cool. And he touches my hair like that. So he touches my hair in front of, of my friend Punit. 
for me, nothing big happened. Yeah. I didn't notice every, anything. And then my friend was like, uh, didn't you notice the way your teacher touched your uh -huh. hair? Like how he, he almost wanted to show that you were his. And I looked at him and I started getting very angry. I was like, don't, don't talk about my teacher like that. He's like a father to me. It's not at all what you may think. And I started really mm -hmm. like getting, like I was defending him, justifying everything, justifying it. Like I did, I don't know why I Whoa. got so angry. And then he was like, why are you justifying so much? Like, why are you putting yourself in such a state? Why are you getting so like, you know, intense? And then I would wonder, that's true. Like, why do I put myself like that? Like, why, why do I become so like, uh, defensive. defending of him? Yeah. Of him? Yeah, defensive. yeah. Defensive. And so that happened a few times and I started getting mm -hmm. angry at my friend, Punit, and I didn't want to see him. But then when the kiss happened and I didn't, like, I went out of the center, randomly, randomly, <laughs> I don't know if life helped here, <laughs> but Punit, crosses my path i was where i was on my computer in a restaurant mm -hmm. and i see him and this time i see him and and i call him and he makes me talk and then i i start saying few details and more and more and more and then in mm -hmm. the end i tell him what happened the kiss and then then he said you need to leave this place and then i then i said yes and so what i did is in the middle of the night i went to take all of my things secretly wait so why why did you feel like you need to take your things secretly i mean no one was keeping you there physically so why did you yes but i was i was scared to face the teacher because i had so much love mm -hmm. for these people mm -hmm. and it's like suddenly this beautiful image that i had became horrible it became like a nightmare mm. and i would and the more i would allow myself to accept the reality of it, the more details I would see. And then mm. all of my memories with them that were beautiful became became ugly. Yeah. So I became very, very nervous. I, I felt like I was waking up from a coma and I was just there for three weeks. Wow. I, I felt like I had a spell on me. That's amazing. And that's crazy because hearing you talk now, I mean, I'm sure anyone listening could just hear how like logical and you know, smart you, you are. And for me, it, it was really shocking to hear that because I know you and I know that I, I just would never expect you to... Not to defend myself, not to say anything. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I've just seen you as like a very, you know, badass like <laughs> woman, you know, and more, more than a lot of other women I know, and you'll stand up for yourself. Yeah, that, that's why I think it's, yeah, I think it's very important to raise awareness about that. It's because it is so very tricky. Totally. And I can see how, like, maybe your one weakness at that moment would have been how, like, your relationship with your parents was maybe struggling a little bit. Do you think that played a huge role or, yeah. or just a minor role? It, it did play a role, but I think that I still didn't know myself. Well, it's just that they kind of led me there. Mm -hmm. But once you're there, I think that would have been the same. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I just because I just want to yeah. challenge this notion that it's only like vulnerable people. Yeah, no, no, it's it's not like it that. could really be anyone. It's just yeah, I saw I saw I saw 50 years old couples going in that place and falling in love with the teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't mean that they would become part of of uh, a community that would stay and live with him but they would come back every year you know like that so you left in the middle of the night you took all your stuff and then what i wake up the girl to tell her i'm leaving and uh and i look at her and she has this big smile on her face and she tells me that she slept with him for the first time oh my god and then i'm like we need to talk. I, I didn't want to leave this girl mm -hmm. behind. I wanted to save her as well, but I was not strong enough. But my friend Punit was. Mm -hmm. He was very convincing. He was a very uh, intelligent person and he knew how to explain things in a strong way. So he took a, a piece of paper and for four hours he talked to her. She looked like a ghost. She was so scary at that time. I remember just after she had sex with him. And she had this smile on her face. Like she knew it was wrong, but she was smiling and laughing about it. 
and she was not herself anymore. I mean, I don't know the girl so much, so I think there was something a bit dark about mm -hmm. her. So he was explaining this whole concept and then he was explaining things about Krishna, the main teacher, and her. And he was very good at this. I can't I, mm -hmm. I can't have the speech that he had, but it was very, very strong and convincing and yeah. clear. And she would agree. She would agree. As he spoke, she would say, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Wow. But I did it anyway. And then she started giving <sighs> us more details about him because... She was so much under his control and he knew that, wow. that he would tell her everything. So he told her horrible stories that he did. He told what? her he killed his own father because he couldn't, ha yeah, he told her that because he oh couldn't handle God. authority. So he, he said to her, hmm. he said to her that he was a demon. He said to her horrible things. He said to her that oh he was practicing God. black magic. Okay, so that was a really creepy, like, that's why it became really a creepy place. I'm not saying all of these places have these yeah. dark things. And I don't even know if all of this that he said to her was true. But she knew all of these facts. And still, she chose not to judge anything. <sighs> and so we kind of really, like, pulled her out of this. Then we left Rishikesh. We went to Delhi. We really went far. We, we actually... With her? Yeah. We found a way to close the center. So you were when you were talking to her, was this in your room in the yeah. center? Yeah, it was in the bedroom, yeah. So you got her to leave literally just right then and there. Yeah. That's insane. She must have been like the way you describe her, it makes her sound like she she wasn't in control of her own body or something like she's this like rag doll. She seemed like pos she seemed possessed. She seems That's totally possessed. So scary. Yeah. And you went all the way to New Delhi and with Puneet as well. How far away was that? Six to eight hours by bus. Wow. And Puneet sounds like a great friend for doing all of this. He, I can say, he, 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 like, I don't know what would have happened to me without him. I, I like to think that I would have had something else that would have helped me to see clearly. I don't think a lot of people mm -hmm. could have done what he did. So what happened when you got to New Delhi? Uh, well, before that, we made her complain to the police about him mm. uh, for sexual ha harassment. And uh, then we went to speak to him. We, we confronted him. Whoa. She didn't come mm -hmm. because she was so much in shock. She slept for like a week, something like that. The shock for her was so strong because she went so far. I didn't go so far in the end. I mean, it was it was a, a little it it was a baby trauma, but uh, I'm very thankful that it happened in my life. I, I'm not like I'm I'm not traumatized by that anymore at all. It was it was shocking mm -hmm. because I didn't expect it. But she went far. She went far. She was in love with him. And how long had she been there? For she had been there for like, I think, five months. But only five months to be that. But but time, time there, like I stayed there three weeks. You don't know how long you've been there. And like for me, it was different because I knew a lot of people outside because I had come to Rishikesh many times. So I had friends. So mm -hmm. I would go out. But this girl, for example, she never went out of the center. That's why I think five months became like two years for her. Yeah, insane. So... So you got her out of the center, you're still in Rishikesh, you make her complain to the police. We confront him, me and Puneet. We meet in a restaurant in front of everybody. It was just next to the center, that's where everybody goes. It's like a cafe place. And uh, I start shouting on him. And so everybody was shocked. Some people were not shocked. Some people were enjoying that because they, they spotted that man. What did you say? You raped my my roommate. Uh, you did these horrible things. You forced me to do that. And you're manipulating everybody. You have horrible ambitions about creating a horrible commune. No one should ever like follow your teachings. Wow. You're so un unethical and you're you're a, you're a pervert. And uh, you know, I said hor I said very strong things. Yeah, good for you. I was very angry and I needed to to face my trauma and to heal that. So I wanted to attract attention, and um, mm. I saw that he was not strong at all. It was the total opposite. He became like a, a little, little, uh, an, an ant, a small, insignificant ant that just wanted to hide. And, and he was scared of me. This man was scared of me. 
I, I saw him as such a grand figure and mm-hmm. like such an amazing person. Yeah. And I realized how small he was. And, and that was very empowering for me. So I had that chance to face him, you know? So yeah. that, that was, that was a very strong moment in my life. And, uh, at that time. And then, and then he, his wife arrived and she was like under his spell as well. And she became all white and all pale and trembling. And she looked so bad that I stopped shouting and we all took her and we were like, it's okay. It's fine. She was like, she was like this crazy ghost. Like she, her face was so scary, but, and, 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 and I, I looked at him and I told him, I told him, Look what you did to your own wife, you know? Mm-hmm. You've been you've been practicing some very weird shit on everybody and on your own wife. Mm-hmm. She was his first and main uh, devotee, you know? Totally, yep. She was, mm-hmm. she was. Yeah, and even he told me this story about how he met her and how he stole her from an- another guru. Oh my gosh, poor yeah. girl. He had, told, he had told me this story. Punit took her in his arms and said, it's okay. And then took her far. Mm -hmm. He left. The conversation was over. And then we went to the police. The police took him, the teacher. And and the wife now is saying to the police, Punit, this man tried to touch me sexually. Are you serious? They accused, (gasps) yeah, they accused Punit of sexual harassment. And she was a white woman. So, you know, like how twisted that became. That's so fucked up. Yeah. Yeah, but the police knew that was not true. The police was on our side. We had told them everything before he arrived and they understood. They understood. Nothing really happened. They kind of like beated him. Beat it. Yeah. Oh, really? They beat him? Uh, like, y- yeah, that, that's not allowed, but like, because they didn't want us to like make a very, very high complaint and the girl didn't want to mm-hmm. either. So he was like, okay, we'll, we'll beat him and we'll stop that. But we understood that the police mm-hmm. would not do anything. Because these these things happen a lot in Rishikesh and they don't want scandals right. to happen. So, so what we did is we talked to all of the small businesses around and we said everything that happened to ruin the center. Mm-hmm. And then Punit uh, found a way because he was renting his place to find the owner of the place. And he talked to him and then the owner threw him out. Wow. So, yeah. And then I got, I got to know like... Two years ago or one year ago that he opened a new center somewhere else now. Oh. So he's going to like history is going to repeat itself. No. So where is his center? Because at least maybe we can put it in this episode so that people don't go there. You know, uh, I, I don't know what he called it because he gave it a new name. But I know his name is Krishna and that he has a Russian one. And the kid is named Osho and he's from the Osho community. Oh, so he got trained there. Oh, Krishna is from the Osho community. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He was there for like decades, I think. Wow. Oh my gosh, that sounds so crazy. I realized that this dynamic exists in all sorts of communities. It can exist in companies. It can exist in many, many other places. So it's not just in the spiritual world. Exactly. Yeah, and I think a lot of the time these people and this is just my personal theory that a lot of these people have personality disorders like narcissism yeah. for example and they really it causes them to seek out this admiration from people yes yes it is true but at the same time i think it's a big mistake that all of these um western people to is to is, is to put the teacher on a pedestal and they all do it because why i don't know because they want to have someone to believe in or something or they want to they want to admire i don't know why is that well that's just part of our that's part of being human i mean we love to to i have idols the royal family celebrities Um, And at the end of the day, we give them the power. When you were telling me about how you realized how small he was, you were actually giving him the power. Once you turned against him, he had no power anymore. That that was a big lesson for me. Like, I really became a less naive uh, person. I grew up so much. I'm, I'm very thankful to what happened to me. Because, you know, like I had this uh, tendency to think that, oh, you know, 
good is there, good is there everywhere in the world, and it is, uh, but bad is there as well, and you have to like you have to watch out for yourself. Definitely, definitely. It must have been really devastating for you, yeah, to have something so beautiful turn into something so ugly. I mean, how did you feel right after, and like in how long did it take you to recover from it? Well, I went, so after Delhi, we came back to Delhi and uh, I pretended like I was going back to France to, with this girl because I didn't want to, to see her again. I think she was, her energy was too, too much mm -hmm. for me. But I left for Goa instead because Kunit was coming from Goa. Mm -hmm. Goa is kind of the same place as, like, it's similar to Rishikesh. It's less intense. Mm. But there is also a lot of spiritual seek. I mean, it's everywhere in India, but these places are very touristy. Mm, lots of white people going to <laughs> spiritual. Lots of white yeah. people. Go yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, there are great things happening. Um, but the place was nice because it was next to the beach. I could go to the beach every day. You know, the I remember I took uh, Muay Thai uh, classes with a, um, a South African uh, woman. She was a t the teacher. So I started doing Muay Thai lesson. I found by my confidence, you know, by learning how to punch someone <laughs> and receive a punch. Yeah. And, you know, that was just like the way I, I healed mm -hmm. myself. I wrote a lot. Uh, I would swim a lot. And uh, I just started to just, yeah, uh, get in touch with myself uh, more again. Mm -hmm. And when I came back to France after a month trauma, uh, I went to see a psychotherapist because I, I felt like I wanted to make sure that th this trauma doesn't stay stuck. And that was just enough mm -hmm. for me. And uh, and then I wanted to go back to India mm -hmm. again because I didn't want to stay on that. Yeah. So, and it was and it was weird because I met this couple. Uh, it was an Indian man and a Belgian, a Belgian woman. And I was like, oh my God, the scenario is gonna <laughs> be the same again. <laughs> In the end, I go, I meet them and they were genuine. There was nothing mm -hmm. like that. The teacher would never talk to me spirituality out of class. And you would see he didn't have a big ego. He would, he was mm -hmm. just a normal person giving mm -hmm. his, his lessons, you know, and there was no spiritual bullshit about it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I stayed there and I learned massage and meditation and that was wonderful. And I would stay in these cafes where all of these uh, Western hippies would go to and which mm -hmm. are very cool, you know, like the places are really nice. And uh, But I would see, I would see the crews here and there hanging out with their tea students, with the girls. And I would hear a lot of stories of girls being raped. And I'm mm -hmm. sure that they were not raped. I'm, like a lot of the time they realize it the next day, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's like they're in a trance. Yeah, it's like it's like oh, you want to attain illumination, you want to attain a, um, uh, you know, uh, consciousness, the consciousness. Then have sex with me, and you will reach illumination. And the girls fall for it, you know. Mm. Some some people don't hide, huh? And and the worst thing is that they use this word, this the mm. spirituality. You know what? Don't call it like that. Don't call it tantra. Just yeah. call it uh, sexual freedom. You know, like there's this place in Goa. I won't say the name because it's too famous, <laughs> but, but they, they give tantric classes like teachers and all. And I know for a fact that everybody gets naked. Nobody knows anybody and everybody faces one dick, you know, and everybody looks at it. Everybody touches it. Everybody sucks it. They, they go so far in these things because tantra is, is the mastery of the sexual energy, but sexual energy doesn't mean that at all. That's not what, that's not what it's about. How do like Indian people and, you know, real Hindu practicers feel about this stuff? Like the tantric sex stuff. They reject it and they don't fall for it. The problem is then the girls, a lot of girls get traumatized and we, you hear it every week. A girl who got raped or a girl who did this. And, <sighs> you know, my parents were so much against that. And they would tell me, ah, you go, you go see a guru and blah, blah. And I was like, I'm not so naive. And, and the problem is also this because it's, mm. it's so stigmatized. Also the cult thing mm. that you think it will be so obvious when you see it. But it's not so obvious. That's important. That's an important point to say, though, that you already went into this knowing that cults were a thing and knowing that, you know, this stuff happens, right? 
and you still kind of got involved. Yeah. Yeah, I said, if I, you know, I will spot it, I will see it, but still they put bullshit in your head in the end. Mm, amazing. Oh, wow, that's so crazy. But then they are great teachers. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that the, the biggest lesson from this is just to be really aware if you're going to want to go and do, um, some of these, you know, go to Goa, Rishikesh or India for spiritual reasons. Yeah. And don't go where there are only white people, because there's also that's a, a very mm. different problem for everything we've talked about is the problem of like the white, the, the Western people going to India and behaving like gods. They, they are like they, they make big parties and they don't want to invite Indians mm. like it's so racist, it racist in the end. Wow. And there are just few cool Indians, good looking hippies mm. who will be in the group so mm -hmm. you know it looks like no we're not racist and we are friends with indians and all but in the end these indians are like western people mm. and uh and uh, so go where the where the locals are the real you know oh also something so, sorry but it makes me think that he only wanted white people as students like i didn't know that but the girl knew i didn't know that because I brought my Indian friend over and because he was my friend, he didn't say anything, but I didn't know. But he asked that he only wanted white people. And why is that? Because Indians, they know. So if you go to a yoga school in India, find a place where Indian people go. Find a place where most students are Indians. You know what? That's I went there and they were the best teachers. They were the less, the least expensive places. There was, there was no spiritual bullshit. So that's a good advice if you want to find a good place. Just go where the Indians goes. Go like like the restaurants. <laughs> Same. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Exactly. Exactly. Go where the locals go. It sounds to me like a lot of, first of all, cultural appropriation is happening too, and yeah. also it sounds very superficial. Yeah. A lot of it as well. Like a lot of it's about sex and yes, they give themselves an image. The guys, the yoga, the, the the Western yoga teachers, the guys, the very long hair, and they always are like shirtless, and they have a very like um, calculated uh, fashion style, mm -hmm. hippie style, which goes against the mentality that you know, who cares how we look like, right. and let's just be natural, and you know, it's not like that. No, in the end, they 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 are so attached to their image. So yes, it is superficial in that way. And they all have spiritual names, so they all call themselves by by uh, God names. Oh no! Uh, like uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, um, this is my uh, Indian name. Yeah. No, it's 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 really weird. And uh, you know, you know what's so funny? Because my name is Luna. That's my real name. Right. And uh, I went to a class one time. <laughs> one guy was like, "So what's your real name?" <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> No, my name's Luna. Like, that's my real name. Oh my, God. <laughs> my parents called me like that. <laughs> because it's so common that people gave themselves yeah. name. And then girls, the yogi girls, they, they become devis. Uh -huh. Devis are goddesses. So then they call themselves goddesses. No, it becomes super uh -huh. narcissistic. And then yeah, it's, it's... My gosh. It's so interesting, though. It's so... In but so anyway, um, what are you doing now? And what's going on in your life after... After all of this, I decided to go home and um, I'm going to work for a, for a massage uh, center, Ayurvedic massage center um, in Antibes. One last thing is that um, like, I don't want this story to, to it, it's not representative of India. It's just one story. I told you this story because it, it's important to raise awareness about these things because we don't know enough about it and we don't hear enough I don't. I don't want that experience of mine uh, that happened at the at the yoga studio to um, to stop you from uh, wanting to to go to India because they live in in such a beautiful way. I really encourage you to go to India if you want to because it's an amazing country and there are like millions of things of things to see and discover. The culture, the food, the language, the beliefs, the gods, the smells. Everything is new. So yeah, just wanted to add that. <laughs> wow. 
Wow, I mean, honestly, it's one of those episodes that I'm frankly just speechless. Um, I don't even know how to react to that. Yeah, this is something that I feel that both of us can't really imagine simply because we probably will never be put in this kind of position simply because of our biological sex. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it could be interesting to talk about some tips, um, you know, from you as well, because let's face it, even if maybe you're as men, you don't feel as unsafe for the same reasons. There are still reasons and safety measures that you take and for good reasons. So should we talk a bit about some safety tips? What do you guys use when you're traveling? Uh, Very good point. As much as I love to explore and, you know, get off the beaten track, and I do think that it's a great idea to go based off of recommendations. Um, yeah. You know, I love these. Quick, <laughs> quick, qu- quick interruption, though. What's interesting about this is that this center was recommended to her, this yoga center, by, by someone she knew. So she explains that that actually put her guard down a little. She always ha- already had the, these great expectations of this place and she had been referred there. So, um, okay. So cut my, cut my part out then. But it's important that, that you bring up that point of, you know, going off of recommendations because most of the time that's really helpful, right? <laughs> Usually that's something you can count on. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let me, let me read to you a few of the travel safety tips on behalf of the Australian government. Don't ask me why I chose the Australian government. I just did. (laughs) Um, But I'll just name Mm -hmm. off a few of the points. I'll name six of them. And then I kind of just want to ask y'all, how many of them do you actually follow through with? Because even Mm. me reading some of these, I know I haven't done this or or some of them. So number one, Mm. keep your travel plans, including accommodation details to yourself. Don't hitchhike. Mm. Try not to travel at night. Avoid more dangerous areas of the cities you visit, especially at night. Ask your hotel manager for advice on safe versus unsafe local areas. Use ATMs during the days when there are people around. And carry contact details of the American embassy. If your city doesn't have an American embassy, find out which other country's embassy is available to you, such as the British embassy. Those are just a few of the recommendations they have. And I know I don't follow all of those. Do you? Mm, Like what? I definitely don't keep the contact details of the American embassy with me at all times. I have oh, never yeah. done that. <laughs> Neither do I. Yeah. Um, um, but, you know, it's a good idea. I don't I see have, the flaw in it. Yeah. Uh, so- yeah, because a lot of the police in certain countries either are not reliable or you may not be able to communicate with them properly. So I've never thought about actually calling an embassy. Yeah. Uh, another one that I don't do is it says to keep your travel plans or including accommodation details to yourself. One of the first things I do when I meet people for the first time, where are you staying? I'm staying here. So I violate that one right off the bat. You know, it's funny because people literally update right. their Facebook mm-hmm. status Yeah. to like marking themselves, mm. you know, oh, I checked into so-and-so hotel or so-and-so hostel. Uh, oh, I I'm know. in this city. Solo travel's the best, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty easy to be stalked nowadays. And so about not traveling way. at night. Uh, okay, maybe as a general rule, this is true. But, you know, there are some places that are best seen at night for whatever reason. If it's the lighting, if mm-hmm. it's the nightlife, if you want to look at that ambiance. So I, I definitely don't follow that rule. Um, I, mm. I think the only one that I read here that I definitely do is use ATMs during the day when there are people around. I'll never right. carry out mm. cash at night ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we're talking, because we're erring on the side of like theft, right? For example, Mm -hmm. like getting Mm -hmm. mugged, which is a far more common, I think, experience than, for example, something that Luna went through. Um, And I think if we're talking about theft, um, I also have some other tips. Um, My number one advice is to not look like you have money because people Mm. will know you're a tourist first of all probably because you will stick out like a sore sore thumb most of the time and so i don't know when i was traveling a long time i had my laptop with me i had my my camera with me and i just made an effort to not look like i had money like i was wearing the same clothes over and over i mean i know you want to get the instagram pictures or whatever but truly if you want to feel a little bit more safe just don't be flashy. I mean, shit, I don't walk around Oakland looking flashy as hell, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. And actually, uh, referring back to when John and I uh, stayed at your house and worked on this podcast for a week, um, I went out to take a phone call at night and I had two neighbors 
come up to me and, you know, give me a warning like, hey, like you're on your phone. Just so you know, there were three robbings here about an hour ago. People got their phones stolen, you know, and I'm yeah, sitting man. there like on my phone walking down the street by myself at night. <laughs> it just felt. I mean, look, look, Oakland, California gets a bad rap, so I don't want to like perpetuate that <laughs> yeah. because it's it's just as dangerous as most metropolitan cities at this point like it does have a notorious history right right but um but like it's just to say that there's like a common sense you know factor here and that just because you're traveling somewhere else um like doesn't necessarily need mean you need to be more aware it just mm. need, you need to be as aware as you would be in your city you know yeah like to pivot to spirituality, like there's something specific about the spiritual world, I think, where uh, people have to be extra careful um, because right. people embark on the, these journeys to to change their, themselves. They are open to change. That's what they want for the most part. Um, and they want to, as Luna puts it, like remove their conditionings. Um, and so it puts you in a very vulnerable position for her it was just a yoga studio like they weren't necessarily promising enlightenment i don't think so just be aware of that circle um i mean there's enough documentaries out at this point to know that this is a problem and we actually put together a list of travel safety tips on our website so visit www.gtspodcast.com uh, check out the blog we have some extra resources there more information about some of our episodes and some of our guests so yeah check that out be sure to follow us on instagram at globetrotters podcast where you'll find photos from some of our previous guests and if you're on facebook subscribe to our facebook page at globetrotters podcast and on the next episode we featured avid outdoors person and nature enthusiast extraordinaire natalie who details her experience hiking and traveling along the western United States during some of the worst forest fires on record. You won't want to miss her brush with death. Brush with death. Ooh, like oh that. my gosh. I like that. Editing on this episode is done by Saskia Hevani, and the mixing has been done by Gregory Friedel. Music is by Thin Blue Collective. You can find their music on Bandcamp and Spotify. 